first of all, thank you. Very good evening and thank you for this invitation. Thank you to the organizers, to, our to the colleagues on the panel and to the audience. Um, it's sad that I can't see the audience, so I, I can't feel the, the reactions, but I'm going to do my best to engage with all of you if possible. Um, as, I as I was introduced some minutes ago, I am Juan Carmach and I serve as project specialist for UNESCO and I'm currently leading a project to advance innovations in digital anthropology. Uh, as you just saw on the presentation just before, the digital anthropology has the potential to deepen our understanding of digital communities and to share lights on the complex interplay between technology and its changes and how changing a platform from YouTube to TikTok can have a massive uh, effect on society and how this interplay goes back and forth. So that is particularly what we're doing on the project. So, so thank you for the previous presentation because it helps to explain what we're doing. For the presentation today, um, I am trying to touch the surface of two questions to then explore them on the following conversation on the panel. So on the one side, I would like to think of what is the role, is what is the extent um, to which social and human science insights can contribute to understand the impact of media and algorithmic decision making and algorithmic societies. And on the other hand, going more specifically to digital anthropology, I would like to show how methods and solutions that the derivate from digital anthropology can be deployed to promote more ethical, inclusive decision making. So that is the objective of what we would like to talk about. Of course, then we can have we can have some time to uh, review the ethical recommendations of artificial intelligence that is the main contribution to UNESCO to this topic. So some of you might be wondering why UNESCO is working on advancing digital anthropology. And the, the answer to the question is quite simple. Uh, together with the role of protecting cultural heritage and promoting global education policies, UNESCO is the agency mandated for international collaboration on science. And on that role, we partnered, in this case, we're partnered with a private sector contributor to develop innovations on in different fields of, of social, social and human sciences. And we act in a way as a laboratory for new methods. Uh, in this case, these anthropology is essential to address some emerging issues in the relation of culture and technology, such as discrimination online, such as misinformation, such as the mental health crisis that we are suffering in all these topics. And also something that is very important in that they track us to uh, the anthropology is that UNESCO recognized cultural diversity as a source of exchange, innovation and creativity and also a right. So we are connected with cultural diversity uh, in ways that help us to promote sciences related to it. That being said, I don't want to have a extremely theoretical presentation, so I prefer to ground it, this presentation on reality. And I would like to discuss a small case on the banking system of Latin America. This is less than two years ago, and I performed interviews with technological and product developers of the major banks in Chile, Argentina, Brazil, Peru, Colombia, and Mexico. And the there's a surprising lack of understanding on the banking system in Latin America on how the algorithms that they are integrating to uh, functions of advertising, uh, function of credit decision making, functions of completing the information of the clients and <clears throat> all across the bank. Uh, they are not even close to the guidelines and recommendations that people in the academia, like all of us probably know. So a couple of examples of these problems. Uh, many of the algorithms for giving credits replicate the past conduct of, uh, of human executives delivering credits. So obviously the discrimination goes from the past to the future and replicates and magnifies. Um, we know because the Inter-American Development Bank has explored 
the discrimination on bank agents that they perform some misogynistic behavior so they don't give credits with the same in the same way to women and this systems now are replicating that and that is obvious for all of us when we think about artificial intelligence but it was not obvious to the bank the se second problem is that in all the fintech applications they were using facial recognition as a basic step to create accounts and we know that facial recognition doesn't work as well with racial minorities doesn't work as well with indigenous minorities and the problem is not necessarily that the system is discriminating that's a big problem but the largest problem is that there's no accountability on the effects of discrimination of all the applications that the banks are using a third level of problem is that when they're completing the information of new clients they use the information of current clients and of course there's a problem of representation new clients are not equal to the current clients so you produce bias on the evaluation of new clients and that may bring discrimination on the process and on top of that when they try to solve the problem they do things like taking out some variables that they think may bring discrimination let's say gender but that's an absolutely ineffective measure why because no uh, neural networks can through correlations bring the same effects of gender to the equation so they're not really solving the problem we know that these things happen in many industries but the larger problem is the lack of connection between research and the knowledge that we have of these systems to policy and that goes to my conversation with regulators in this area the regulators of the banking systems are used to audits and they were looking for a way to measure discrimination in the algorithms there, I know of more than 22 ways to measure discrimination on algorithms, but the question is not uh, how to use them, but the question is that all these different measures are connected to visions of society, with culture, with law, with vision of politics and vision in general. All of these mathematical equations behind have a deep context. And regulators, sadly, are not equipped to deal with the political consequences of implementing these tools so they don't do it. This is just one example to try to ground the problem that we have. And of course, algorithmic, uh, algorithmic societies have many problems, but they are more present in social media and connecting with TikTok. We know that TikTok is the social network that is expanding uh, in the fastest way. On the third trimester of 2021, more than 120 million people activated TikTok. And what you're seeing here is just a small experiment of someone that created accounts, new accounts, and saw as a first video a transphobic video. <clears throat> and then track and classify all the following videos that the algorithm was showing. So he, this, the researchers started with transphobic videos, but the platform alone start to show homophobic videos, misogynist videos, racist videos, and then start to promote violence, start to promote anti-Semitism and conspiracy theories. And these are the classical case of a family member that goes to what we call technically the rabbit hole. And suddenly they appear back, believing a lot of things that they are absolutely foreign to them because the algorithm takes the consumption of videos of other of other uh, users and replicate those uh, trends on the new users. Of course, this only scratched the surface of the problems that can be caused by media-driven and algorithmic societies. But the root cause of the problem, I believe, is on the unbalance between the investment on developing the technology and developing the digital world that is on the order of 1.8 trillions. Uh, that is the GDP of a large developed country. That's the GDP of Spain. That's the GDP of Canada. That is invest every year on developing these platforms. But on the other hand, we don't invest nearly enough on education, science, technology, and the connection between science and policy to manage the digital transformation that is happening behind all these trends. And <clears throat> Well, a good question is, what are these investments doing or, or, or what 
technologies are these investments happening? And what we know, and we know very well because of the recent reduction on scale of many technological companies that prioritize some sectors and decrease their interest in other sectors that they are working on artificial intelligence, big data, neuroscience, very connected to the attention economy that we're, we're just describing. The metaverse and on the background of all of this is the transition to the green economy that is affected for the consumption of all of these new technologies. And what we're witnessing is the expansion of general purpose technologies. So these are technologies that can change all of our activities and they're happening at the same time. And if we see the experience of a previous general purpose technology as it was computing, what it tends to happen is that it starts with things that are very evidently computing, statistics, auditing, uh, accounting. But then we transform other problems of society to problems of computing. And probably what's going to happen now is that we're going to transfer different problems of society to problems of neuroscience, big data, virtual reality, and of course, the predictive capacity of artificial intelligence. And we're going to transform pro problems into problems of prediction. As I said, there's a deep connection with climate change. All the images that are here are images created by generative AI. So AI that inverts the relation, so instead of predict, creates, changing some of the concepts. And there's projections that through the augmented consumption of energy of generative AI, computing is going to become the largest consumption of energy uh, in the next decade. So there's a deep relation there. That being said, the first question is to what extent we need social and human sciences to approach these problems. Well, there's a, a couple of reflections here, but of course we need social and human sciences to address the ethical problems that arrive from a society that is based on predictions, um, the predictions through artificial intelligence. At the same time, all of these predictions, we need to put them into a context that humans can understand. And there's a process of sense making, a process of creating cultural and social hypotheses that can help us to observe, understand, give meaning to the predictions that are made by machines that we can't understand ourselves directly. Of course, uh, we need SHS to avoid some of the unethical uses, like the exploitation of cognitive biases of neuroscience or the possibility of spreading misinformation and harassment on the metaverse. We need to understand the structural consequences of the concentration of wealth and power that arise from these technologies. Only a few companies in a few places, most of them in the global north, can deploy um, for example, generative AI. And finally, we need SHS to challenge the assumptions of the developers of these technologies with questions about power, questions about society that are not usually raised. Looking on the other side, we also need to think on how we can use these technologies to improve our research on SHS. And that's where digital anthropology comes uh, for us. Let me switch to digital anthropology. Uh, why are we working on digital anthropology? Well, because of all of these capacities create the potential to change belief systems and values in a scale and speed that is new to society. And that has effects on the personal level. So we know that mental health and also discrimination and gender um, stereotypes are spread at a faster uh, speed. It has consequences in a community level. So the conspiracy theories are based on communities that exist because of the social media platforms. It affects societies. So we have seen in the US and in Brazil how social media algorithms and particularly Telegram were on the base of some of the attacks on the institutions. And of course, it changes also how we relate with technology. And ChatGPT is an excellent example of how this change of belief systems affects are we related with technology? So what is digital anthropology? I'm going to super simplify this and we can have a longer conversation, but we see it as 
currently we rely too much on big data. So we rely on the interactions and the transactions and the numbers and the service that we can extract from the, from the cyberspace. But there are, there's also anthropology that is asking for the why questions that we can observe on the context, on the feelings, on the stories, on the rituals, and what is called thick data. And by this anthropology, we, um, we're working with the blending of these two spaces. So we believe of blending big and thick data, the observations, just like we saw in the previous presentation, with the massive trends that we can see on the data to understand the digital communities on speed and scale. So this anthropology could be the study of uh, online community as QAnon or as the Balkan influencers. It helps us to understand the experience and values that uh, change the economies, the market. So we, if you can remember GameStop and all the phenomena that happened there, it helps us to merge the data and the training capacities of data science with anthropology help us to blend these two sources of data to reveal context and help us to gain cultural insights. And that's something we can explore more on the questions. And we recently presented a study showing the frontier of the digital anthropology, so where the science is. And we see it like this. On the one side is all the methods, like digital ethnography, they are digitalizing the human. So it's doing digital research of human experiences. There's a large trend, particularly that emerged in the early uh, 2000s, of humanizing the digital space. So the concerns about the ethical development of artificial intelligence, the concerns on, in general, ethics and science, data and science biases. And in the middle is the space that we think is more interesting. There is the techno anthropology, digital anthropology, the space where there's collaboration, but it's also training of anthropologists and data scientists on the and, and the other fields in exercises that are reflective. So you create an algorithm to help you research, but then you analyze anthropologically, anthropologically that same tool. So for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into all the methods that we uh, that we reveal on the report. And I'm just going to tell you one thing that digital anthropology is an emerging field, but is rooted um, on a large tradition of anthropology. So you can go back to Malinowski and the first studies of anthropology and Clifford Glenn's and the definition of thick data and how that was related then to all the trends of data anthropology in the early 2000s and then created a current wave of innovation where people are using data science and anthropology together. So it's not, it, it, it's, it's sustained on a long academic tradition. And just to close, uh, this is an invitation to review the things that we have done. We have the publication with all the trends of the anthropology. We did a call for evidence asking researchers to send their own research using these methods and we identify cases on extreme speech on attacks on democracy, on like a number of different cases, reproductive health. Uh, we perform a design challenge using these methods to create policies to address discrimination and violence online. We can talk about that. And we're about to publish a toolkit so for people to use these methods in an interactive way. <laughs>